Hello and welcome to the Elephant Lounge. I'm your host Tuesday and I want to thank you so much for joining me and we are back for the second episode of Why Are They Guilty? Now in the first episode I talked to you about propaganda and I gave you some of the characteristics and elements of propaganda and how to sort of deal with this material and in this episode, I will be presenting to you a piece of propaganda and we're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about the elements of it. What are some of the things that they use? What are some things to look out for? What are some questions that we need to ask? So they will tell you something. The one thing you want to keep in mind is listen to what they tell you and then try and think of the things that they're not telling you. And as I said, I will stop and basically provide provide some feedback and make some notes for you. I have to say this is going to be long, so I apologize, but there's a lot of stuff that I want to say. I have already done a rehearsal of this, so I've already viewed this prior. There's a lot of things that we need to discuss, and I think it'll be very helpful, and I hope to kill two birds with one stone, meaning the main focus of this series will be just to talk about propaganda in general. These will be things that apply to all forms of propaganda, whatever true crime we're talking about. So these will be elements and ideas that you can transfer on to other true crime cases. And then the other, the secondary uh, benefit to, to this will be the fact that we're talking about the Michael Jackson case, because this pertains to Michael Jackson. And that's something that I've been talking about for quite some time. So hopefully you will find this interesting and engaging, and we will go ahead and get started. So this is a piece called Lies of Leaving Neverland. And this was incidentally posted on one of my podcasts by a Michael Jackson supporter because I guess they assumed that this was going to convince me. Interestingly enough, this is exactly the sort of material that I'm talking about. This particular piece of propaganda is very uh, sophomoric. I would call it Propaganda 101. They, They use very common elements of propaganda, meaning it's not a very clever piece of propaganda to the unsophisticated viewer or somebody who's not used to understanding or recognizing the elements of propaganda. I can see where somebody would be very much sucked into this form of communication, as it were. I can see where somebody would be influenced by material such as this. So we are going to go ahead and get started. We're looking at Exhibit 579. Um, The statement that you wrote was, Michael Jackson changed the world, and more personally, my life forever. He is the reason I dance, the reason I make music, and one of the main reasons I believe in the pure goodness of humankind. He has been a close friend of mine for 20 years. His music, his movement, his personal words of inspiration and encouragement, and his unconditional love will live inside of me forever. I will miss him immeasurably but I know that he is now at peace and enchanting the heavens with a melody and a moonwalk. I love you, Michael. Is that right? That's what I wrote, yeah. Okay, so right away we have Michael Jackson, footage of him looking very healthy and robust. This is obviously during his prime when his nose didn't fall off or he had to wear a mask because his nose, but uh, obviously he's looking very happy and very successful. And then you have this juxtaposed against Wade, who is at a very uncomfortable time during his deposition where he is, he's forced to having to admit that he lied. He lied about Michael Jackson and who he was. In the past, he had praised Michael Jackson. And now, of course, he's talking about the abuse that he endured. As we go on here, we'll see another bit of imagery here. We have the leaving Neverland in the original font, and then it looks as though someone came along and scrawled lies on top of that and red. I mean, it's almost symbolic of blood. And then in the background, we have an image of Wade and he's holding his hand up like that. Well, why would you be doing that? It's because you're swearing in to tell the truth. There's a bit of imagery here. They're trying to obviously make the statement that, oh, you know, here he is. He says he's going to tell the truth, but these are actually lies. We just want to keep in mind, I mean, at this point, I'm not going to call this propaganda because, you know, look, we don't don't know if if 
this is really going to expose lies, then it could be a very valuable piece of information for us. This is kind of a clue that perhaps there might be a little bit of some drama going on. And we see that because of the imagery here. And again, they already did that imagery at the very beginning, the very first scene of showing Michael at his prime and then Wade in a very vulnerable state. Wade Robson who met Michael Jackson when he was five years old after winning a dance contest in Australia. For decades, he never missed a chance to refer to himself as a close friend of the pop star, someone who was his mentor and largely responsible for Robson's successful career as a dancer, choreographer, and stage director. In this 2016 deposition, never before seen publicly, Robson talks about that glowing tribute he wrote to his longtime friend, Michael Jackson, in the days after the pop superstar died. I love you, Michael. So I'll just pause it right here because I want to make some notations here. We have the music. Okay, that, there's, that music is not necessary, especially the type of low vibrational tones, sort of a suspense. And then you have the descriptions of the two men. One is this mentor, and he's great, and he's responsible for Wade's career. And then the other is just sort of this fan, and he sort of clung on to Michael Jackson. So we sort of have these descriptions. But again, you know, let's give it a few minutes and see what's going on. We're back to some footage from the deposition. Obviously, we're going to get back to them confronting him about his praise of Michael Jackson. So let's see how this goes. Is that right? That's what I wrote. Yeah. But now Wade Robson is singing a different tune. He and another proven liar, James Safechuck, claim they were sexually abused by Michael Jackson as young boys in a one-sided so-called documentary called Leaving Neverland. Okay, so right away we have a couple talking points here, and these are the talking points that are very indicative of the Michael Jackson fan base. We have them calling James Safechuck a proven liar. They have not proven him a liar, so this is what they're not telling you. They're not telling you what he's lied about or where it's been proven that he's a liar. Will they? Maybe. We'll go ahead and keep that in mind. That's what I'm talking about. Listen to what they tell you, and then think about what they're not telling you. The other thing they're talking about is is the one-sided documentary. And of course, this is another popular talking point because what they're trying to say is they're trying to make the documentary Leaving Neverland what they want it to, to say. And the fact of the matter is Leaving Neverland was about the grooming. It was about the grooming of the family and what they went through and their experience. That's the main focus of the documentary. The idea that it's one-sided, I mean, certainly that would be a subjective inference, and I can certainly understand that. At the same time, there's a little bit of a deception going on there. It really depends on how you're looking at it. If you if you really are objective, you recognize that the documentary is focused on the grooming of these young boys and their families and what their experience was as far as their interaction with Michael Jackson and the abuse that they went through. So that's not really one-sided. It's their story. We'll let that slide. <laughs> Everybody wanted to meet Michael or be with Michael. And then he likes you. Critics say leaving Neverland only has one goal. Money. Wade Robson and James Safechuck both swore under oath that Michael Jackson did nothing inappropriate to them. Then, in a failed effort to get rich, they changed their stories to seek a huge, multi-million dollar monetary payday in lawsuits against Jackson's estate and companies. Their lawsuits against the Jackson estate have been dismissed not once, but twice. Nonetheless, they are pending on appeal, so Robson and Safechuck are still holding out hope for a big jackpot, and hope this one-sided hit piece leads them to their pot of gold. If there's a 
Okay, so this is interesting. So we have some imagery, we have some money, we have the talking point of them. They want money. That's what they're doing this for. They show a little imagery of James and Wade sort of laughing. We have no context of what they're laughing about, but the insinuation is that they're laughing because they're laughing all the way to the bank or something along those lines. And their lawsuits were dismissed. Well, they tell us that their lawsuits were dismissed, but they didn't say why. The lawsuits were dismissed missed because of the statute of limitations. That's hardly the suggestion that they seem to be making here, which is that the lawsuits were somehow thrown out because of the merits. And that's simply not true. Of course, we have the imagery of the money. They've told us that they are doing this for money, that somehow this is going to be a big payday for them. That's what they told us. It's not really an efficient way to get money is to go through a lawsuit to humiliate yourself, to tell the world you were abused by somebody. I mean, I guess, uh, but we'll wait and see what they have to say. I mean, are they going to explain to us why they think this is their motive? Are they going to offer us any evidence? Obviously, the answer is no. But, you know, these are the kinds of things you want to keep in mind when, when you're watching something like this. And I would say, at this point, we can safely say that this is indeed propaganda, because they're saying a lot of things, but they're not really explaining anything. So, let's go ahead and continue. Potential financial payout of hundreds mm. of millions of dollars. There is an, there is an incentive... <laughs> That litigation over the last five years or so has generated many, many hundreds of pages of legal documents in the form of sworn declarations, deposition transcripts, motions, judgments, etc. And anybody who's been following the case and following those documents has been published will be aware that there are significant problems with these guys' stories. One of them was caught committing perjury uh, in his creditors' claim. So we knew before the film came out that the two protagonists on whose stories it was based had credibility issues. Okay, so we have this voiceover from, from some reporter, and then they showed this imagery from all these other reporters. Uh, I guess the idea is to get the audience to believe that none of these reporters believe Wade or James. They make the accusation that they were caught lying to the court. I, will they get into this? I don't know. Again, just very bizarre. Let's go on. Let's continue. Skeptical media throughout the world are questioning director Dan Reed's agenda in making the film. They see through the litany of one-sided accusations from two known liars who repeatedly spin a salacious drumbeat of alleged sexual abuse. While okay, I like this one. This is something that is very common. Now, this is 101 propaganda. They pull out these headlines and they say these are skeptic media or questioning. Whatever line that was, I apologize. But let's see, we got Daily Wire. I like Daily Wire. I don't have a problem with them. But it, they're hardly any type of... Uh, I don't, I don't want to say that they're not credible, but they're not popular. Okay. And you have Showbiz 411. I mean, what is that? A blog? Uh, Express. And then it looks like we got Hollywood Insider up there. I think that's what it was. Um, Michael Jackson exonerated. Second sex abuse claim by Jimmy Safejuck dismissed by court because of the statute of limitations. Uh, what's this other one? Levy Neverland's director attempt to spin. I don't know what that word is. Discrepancy appears to backfire. Uh, report. Levy Neverland discrepancy found in key part of film denouncing Michael Jackson. Okay, so we'll, we, we gotta see what this discrepancy is. This is gonna be good, I'm sure. While offering not one shred of evidence or independent corroboration to support their stories. Okay, so here we go. We're done. As far as this is a total lie. Absolutely a total lie. Uh, Wade and James did did these people even watch Leaving Neverland? There were recordings of Michael Jackson, both video and audio that James and Wade provided, pictures. We know that these two were very close with Michael Jackson. We know that they slept alone in bed with Michael Jackson. We have independent witnesses that were, that testified. We have maids that stated they saw inappropriate behavior with Michael and Wade and Michael. 
Michael and James. These are things that are indeed cooperated. We also have the families, the mothers. There's a lot of information and anyone that has been following this case for as long as I've been following it knows that there's plenty of evidence and information that cooperate their story. So this is just flat out lie. It's not even something that could be considered a distortion or maybe a misrepresentation. No, it's a flat out lie. So now we can deem this as propaganda 100% certain. And now we'll, we'll go ahead and pay attention. We'll really focus on all of the elements. Just two accusers who have admitted lying in the past and changed their stories a number of times. Okay, so this is interesting, and this happens a lot with people who are giving deceitful information. They end up debunking themselves, and they don't even realize it. So they admit that James and Wade lied, because they did, okay? But by doing that, they're essentially saying that Michael Jackson did indeed molest them. But they're so focused on attacking them that they don't even realize that's what they just did. By calling them liars, because they admit that they lied. They're proving exactly what what they've been saying. Again, they're only going to focus on really attacking the victims here. Where is the discussion about Michael Jackson's behavior? Are, are they going to talk about Michael Jackson sleeping in bed alone with these young boys? I think we know the answer to that. So the entire film rests on their word and nothing else. Your journalism has been heavily criticized uh, because you didn't include the opposing points of views in the film. Was that a conscious decision from the get-go? If you're going to be mentioning Michael Jackson, though, don't you have some obligation to get in touch with the people who have his interests, even though he's not here, obviously? Because you're saying and you're repeating some pretty extraordinary things, don't you have an obligation to talk to the family, even if you claim this isn't about him? Well, you know, what does the family know about the sexual abuse that happened? Do you think they know about the sexual abuse? But it, when you're doing it, this is a documentary. <laughs> it say, is, yeah. right? So when you're doing a documentary, don't you have an obligation to at least ask the question? Because you don't know what the answers to questions are until you ask. Well, we know we know that the family and the estates and Jackson during his lifetime and his lawyers all denied that any sexual abuse took place. And those views are strongly represented in the film. We give those views a lot of time in the film on screen. This is a huge payday, potentially, for anyone who can establish they were victims. And I'm not questioning them. I don't know the truth. Mm. I'm questioning you as the director because you never went to the Jackson family before you finished We don't make any allegations about the Jackson family. So why would I... Why well, would you I make an allegation them? that Michael Jackson's a paedophile. Yeah, so I make allegations about Michael, but Michael's dead. But he's dead. And I've put his rebuttals, yeah. his denials in the film. So the, so the devil's advocate would say, well, I, OK, the guy's dead. Mm. He can't respond to this. He but Wade, Wade Robson and James Safechuck are not dead. Jackson. So here we go again with this one-sided documentary. It's the same talking point over and over again. And I think if they believe, if they say it loud enough, that somehow it's going to be true. But why are they not discussing the fact that when Michael was alive, he did not defend himself. He did not take the stand and defend himself. No, of course he didn't. Because he's guilty. We all know that. And the majority of us already knew and understood. That includes all of the investigators, by the way. It includes the experts in psychology, the psychiatrists that examined uh, both Jordan and Gavin, for example. Those two went through rigorous interviews and evaluations and were found to be very credible and consistent. Even in 2005, when Michael Jackson was at trial, he did not defend himself. So this idea that, you know, he's being unfair because he didn't include a bunch of nobodies who really didn't know anything to begin with, them saying, no, that didn't happen. I mean, it's just so bizarre to me how they can make this claim. And again, if you watch Leaving Neverland, its focus was on the grooming, why they waited so long to come forward and their problems and struggles to deal with the fact that they were abused and to go through all that emotional turmoil and then to come out to their family and to come out to their friends and all of the stuff that they've gone through. That's what the focus of the documentary is on. It's just another deception. It's an attempt to manipulate the audience 
into believing that somehow Michael Jackson is the victim. He is the poor victim. Even though he was the one with the power, he was the one with the celebrity, he was the one with the lawyers, he was the one with the cash, he was the one who leaked stories and attacked these families. Somehow they're trying to turn him into the victim. It's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. Jackson was accused in 2003 by the Santa Barbara County District Attorney, who some said carried out a personal vendetta against Michael Jackson that lasted for more than a decade. So now they've made another accusation. What's the accusation? That some say there was a personal vendetta against Michael Jackson by the DA. Are they going to tell us where the proof of this is? Or is this just an, another accusation that they're going to leave out there like a dangling modifier? Where is the evidence for that? And if you say some say, well, who's some? Michael Jackson's defense attorneys? They don't say, of course. They just throw that out there. They don't give you any evidence to prove that, but by them saying it, by them saying it is somehow them proving it. These are the things you need to watch for when it comes to propaganda. They will do this over and over and over again. Well, we haven't ruled anything out. In 2005, Jackson was declared innocent by a jury in a case involving a boy named Gavin Arvizo. One that's wrong. You're not declared innocent. And I don't know if this is on purpose or I I mean I always try and give people the benefit of the doubt but something like this some well produced uh, video like this the people should know the basic facts being found not guilty does not mean you are found innocent the only types of cases where a person would be found innocent is if for instance you had a trial and during the middle of that trial or maybe even after that trial and years later or something they actually find the person that committed the crime. Now that's happened. If that happens, then the other person would be considered innocent. You now have the real killer or the real criminal. But if you go through a trial, I mean, let's face it, you're the only reason why you're going through a trial is because the state likely has a very good case against you. But if for some reason you get off, you are found not guilty. Not guilty is not synonymous with innocent. So the fact that they're putting this in here is once again a manipulation. They're trying to manipulate the audience that Michael Jackson, he's a victim. CNN legal analyst Jeffrey Tubin called an absolute and complete victory for Michael Jackson and an utter humiliation and defeat for the prosecution. Since and this is just a little bit of nitpicking, but I mean, a CNN analyst, okay, great. And then they put the words on the screen because I guess they expect that to be more powerful. That's just some imagery. Um, this might sound like a little bit of nitpicking, but this is stuff that's very common. These are just things you need to look out for because they trigger emotions by seeing the words and seeing that stuff spelled out for you. It solidifies. It's supposed to help solidify that idea inside your head because you're hearing the words, you're reading the words, it's creating more connections inside your brain. That's what this is attempting to do. It's trying to convince you of a conclusion. They haven't actually given you any facts or walked you through anything or told you anything, but they, they are trying to get you to that conclusion and they're trying to do so through feelings and hyperbolic words. Leaving Neverland was released. Numerous errors, misrepresentations, omissions, and outright falsehoods have been identified in the film, which relies solely on ever-changing stories of Robson and Safechuck. Ooh, so let's hope that they tell us about these things. We're six minutes and seven seconds in. I just, I can't wait to hear about all of these lies and distortions. Leaving Neverland is a film that has been shown to include provable lies, conflicting accounts, contradictions, staged reshoots, faked scenes, reconstructed memories, critical information omitted, manipulated news clips, discredited source material, and key motives ignored. So they've provided us with a bit of an outline here, which is interesting. They used some very vivid graphic imagery. 
Perhaps the most glaring fabrication in Leaving Neverland comes from accuser James Safechuck, who clearly lied in the film by claiming he was sexually abused in the Neverland train station Michael Jackson had built to resemble the one at Disneyland. But there's a big, big problem with this story. A huge discrepancy in the timeline. He says that one of the locations where Michael Jackson was abusing him on a daily basis was the Neverland train station. Right. And he vividly describes the interior of the train station. Now, this version of the story that he tells in the TV show places that abuse in the train station in 1988-89. The train station did not even open until 1994, and as you correctly say, in his sworn declarations, in his ongoing litigation with the estate, he says that Michael Jackson stopped molesting him when he was around 14 years old in 1992 because he got too old for him. And the whole narrative of this film is that Michael Jackson molests boys. And then when the boys hit puberty and get too old, he then ditches them and moves on to a younger boy. That's the whole narrative that right. they're selling with this documentary. But when it's revealed that this location where uh, Safe Chuck is describing him. Okay, so I'm just going to pause it there because that says September 2nd, 1993. And it's interesting because, and I've talked about this before, but there was an interview that someone had dug up that was done years ago before anybody ever knew James or Wade were going to come out and say anything about Michael Jackson by Harrison Funk, some photographer. He recalls specifically, and by the way, without prompting, this was a special spontaneous admission that was made by him where he states unequivocally that Michael Jackson contacted him asking him not to film the train station because he had not received the permit. If the permit was approved in 1993, it's abundantly clear that this took place prior to that. And that's an admission from a completely independent person during a time when he had no idea that anything he would say would be under scrutiny or he's telling us that that train station was there prior to the permit. Now I realize he's trying to say something different right now, but we heard what he said. It's before before he knew about any of this other stuff. I find that to be highly credible and it was a very specific story. The other problem here is that James never gave a year. That is not true. We also know that he was a very young boy at the time. I remember a lot of stuff when I was a kid, but I don't remember the order in which everything occurred. James also has pictures of the train station. If the train station wasn't there when he was at Neverland, how does he have pictures of it? Maybe that abuse stopped around that time. There are a lot of reasons why James might have a fuzzy memory of this. Yeah, he's acting just like every other person, male figure that is, that has been groomed and abused by somebody. It takes an average of 20 years. That's an average of 20 years for male victims to come forward and talk about their abuse. If they come forward at all, no question in my mind that he he was in, certainly abused in that train station. And to call him a liar, a lie is something you're, you're saying that you know to be untrue. And quite frankly, there's no evidence to show that James is purposefully misleading or saying something that he believes is untrue or knows is untrue. That is an absurd conclusion to make. That's an absolutely vile thing to say, especially considering the fact that these two are victims. Authorities knew years ago in 1993 when they first investigated Michael Jackson that these two were lying to them. They knew they were victims of Michael Jackson. And instead of talking about Michael Jackson, Jackson's behavior and talking about how he slept in bed with these boys and they're attacking the victims and calling them liars. This is not evidence of a lie, no matter how much they want it to make it out to be. And even if he's wrong on this, one discrepancy does not tear down what has happened to him. His abuse is, it, it did not exist when he was the age he said he was. Dan Reed, the director of the documentary, goes onto Twitter and says, 
well, there's no dispute about when the train station was built, but what's in dispute is the dates of the abuse. Right. So James Safechuck was abused right. it, after the after the train station was built. Well, right. firstly, he is now accusing his own star witness of perjury because James Safechuck. And here again, now they're attacking Dan Reed, and this is what they do with everything. Dan Reed is trying to say exactly what everyone else has been saying, and anyone with a, a mind can understand this. I'm sorry that it's too nuanced for some people to figure out. Abuse is ugly. It's messy. It's complicated. Victims are going to be confused about things. But I have no doubt in my mind that he was abused in the train station. At what age? At what time? That train station we know was there before 1993. I have no doubt about that, especially considering everything that I know about Michael Jackson. This is what poking holes is. But ultimately, no matter how many holes they poke in this this scenario, inside this narrative, they cannot tear down the entire narrative. And that's their problem. And attacking Dan Reed is not going to prove anything other than they're protecting a pedophile. Chuck has signed not one but two sworn declarations in which he states that Michael Jackson never abused him after 1992. Right. So in order to defend his documentary, he's throwing its star witness under the bus mm -hmm. by calling him a perjurer, but also he's upended the Calling him a perjurer where? This is the kind of stuff that I'm talking about. These accusations are made and they're not supported by any facts. Again, the only thing they've shown is that it's very difficult for an adult male to remember all the little details that happened to him while he was abused by a monster freak with a plastic face. This is a problem when you're dealing with people who are very rigid in their thinking and they're very inconsistent. You'll notice that people who defend Michael Jackson, they allow for any type of uh, nuance when it comes to Michael Jackson. They don't care that he owned books with naked children in them. That's okay with them. They don't mind that he built an amusement park or that he had a zoo to lure children in. They don't care that he fit the profile of a pedophile and had multiple allegations. That's okay. But when it comes to James or Wade, oh boy, you know, it's black and white. There's no room. You better know every date, every time, every little detail down to the color of your socks that you wore that day because otherwise you're a liar. The entire narrative of his documentary. Leaving Neverland contradicts the alleged victim's own sworn depositions. In the video, Wade Robson spins a dramatic tale of being left this is really egregious right here. So they show this excerpt from a document, but they don't say where this document comes from. So let's read it. The trial judge in Robson's initial case against the estate found one of Robson's lies on the key issue in the case, i.e. when he learned about the estate for statute of limitation purposes, so clear that the judge took the extraordinary step of disregarding Robson's sworn statement on a summary judgment motion. The judge found that no rational fact finder could possibly believe Robson's sworn statement, i.e. his lie under oath, given the unequivocal evidence to the contrary, and issued judgment in the estate's favor as a result. That's not true. Number one, they don't show you the actual, the actual judgment, do they? If they were going to show you facts, they would go to the primary source, which is the actual judgment, and show us where the judge said that. What the judge was talking about is that there would be no rational fact finder that could possibly believe that the Jackson estate would be responsible because it was shown that Michael Jackson was the final say, meaning nobody, Michael Jackson didn't report to anybody else. He was the head. That's what the judge was talking about. Anybody who actually read the judgment would know that. This statement right here, is pulled from the lawsuit, the filings with HBO when the estate went after HBO. That's where this is pulled from. It is a complete distortion. And this kind of stuff just irritates me. It's just one thing after the next. Left alone in 1990 with Michael Jackson at Neverland. Robson claims that while his family was hundreds of miles away at the Grand Canyon, Michael Jackson abused him for the first time. 
But that's not the story Robson told in his lawsuit against Jackson's companies or in a deposition under penalty of perjury just months before HBO's cameras began rolling. There, he claims his family was still at Neverland when it first happened, and his sister was sleeping upstairs in Michael's room. Two entirely different versions of events told by Wade Robson, just two months apart. The first night, the night prior, we both slept in the bed with Michael. Mm-hmm. Um, and at some point that second night, she said to me, I think we should, you know, you and I should sleep upstairs. I don't know why. Um, I, mean, I don't know why she said that or why she thought that. But I didn't want to. Um, so, yeah, so then I, then, then when, whenever it was bedtime, you know, she went upstairs and Michael and I stayed in the bed downstairs. And I believe at some point that night the abuse started. So, which is it? The version Wade Robson tells in a sworn deposition or his version in Leaving Neverland? If he changes his story in two months for the cameras, how can you trust him at all? This is... Oh my gosh, here we go again. The boy was seven years old, okay? He's going back. He's trying to put information together. He knows that he was abused at some point when they first visited Neverland. What they're really attacking here is a discrepancy of a day or two. So they stayed at Neverland the first night. His sister and him apparently slept in the room with Michael Jackson. That was in the documentary. His sister slept upstairs the second night. That was in the documentary. And then he was abused by Michael Jackson. They're literally trying to nitpick at one night. Now, if you're going back into your past and you're trying to remember all this stuff when you're seven years old, there's nothing terrible terribly shocking about somebody saying, wait a minute, it did, I think it did happen this night. I remember something did happen. And then I remember, you know, this, this may have happened. The more you think about things, the more information comes to you. I, I like to describe memory sort of like a sandwich, as it were. Okay, so if I'm going to tell you a story, let's say I tell you a story about my past when I was a little kid, I'm going to go right there to the meat of the issue that I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to talk about the the main pertinent event that happened in my life. I'm going to tell you the story. A lot of times what happens is when we go back into our past and we're retrieving these events that happened to us, it might be an hour later, two hours later. It could be a few days later in many cases. It could be a month later. Now that we've retrieved that memory, a lot of times something else will come back to us. We'll remember just what happened just before that or what remember what happened just after that like the bread as it were and then we'll start remembering the ketchup and the lettuce we'll start remembering more and more details these are how memories work so nothing that Wade is saying or conveying whether it's in his deposition or his, his original complaint or what he's saying right now this is all very very common instead of trying to understand this or maybe interview somebody who deals with memory? Why didn't they interview somebody or a psychiatrist or somebody who specializes in memories and learning about memory? They're out there. There's an expert for everything. Why not interview somebody about that and talk about how memories are retrieved in our minds and how they can evolve? Now, that might not be a a comfortable reality that Jackson fans want to deal with, but that is the truth. You can look this stuff up online. You can talk to an expert. We all know people. I mean, ask around, ask your doctor, see if they can give you some information that you can read about because it's out there. Nothing that he says is inconsistent with that reality. Yet this video, this piece of propaganda, it's trying to manipulate the audience by suggesting that somehow this is on purpose, that he's purposefully lying or distorting. And I also want to include that if you go back and look at my podcast when, where I talk about Maureen Orth and I go through her article that she wrote, in one of those articles, she had interviewed a staff member back in 2004. 2004, people, this is before 
before Wade or James came forward. And the staff member specifically mentions Wade being left at Neverland alone the first time he visited. Boom, there's your cooperation. So no, he's not a liar. And that came back from 2004. But that's not all. Earlier testimony by Robson and his mother contradict the entire 1990 story told in Leaving Neverland that director Dan Reed uses as a foundation for the film. Robson's mother Joy testified in 1993 that her son was never alone with Michael Jackson at Neverland until that year. And here she is seen confirming under oath in 2016 that her entire family, husband, parents, and kids, went on the trip to the Grand Canyon. I understand that you stayed then two different weekends at Neverland on that trip, is that right? Yes. And then in between you and your kids and your husband and your parents all went on tourist trip to the Grand Canyon? Yes. So you were there, is it two nights the first time? Yes. And then you came back after... Um, and this is a bit deceptive because she did go with her kids and her family to the Grand Canyon. Wade was left behind. The way they worded it, they didn't say, they didn't ask her which kids. They didn't specify. They're trying to distort what she's saying. This kind of stuff just frustrates me, you guys. This, this is the kind of stuff that really frustrates me because it's so deceptive. And, the, and just to think they're attacking victims, that's the thing that just kills me. They're attacking victims. They're not talking about Michael Jackson. They're not talking about why he had little boys sleeping in bed with him alone. Oh, no, we don't want to talk about that. Let's attack the people that are victims. It's just disgusting to me. Your whole family had gone away. Yes. And you spent another, what, two nights? At Neverland, yes. Robson himself testified as an adult that the first time he visited Neverland without his mother was in 1992 or 1993, which means he would not have been alone at Neverland with Michael Jackson in 1990. As leaving. He was alone. He was alone. And he has somebody to cooperate that from 2004. Neverland claims... In other words, Robson and his family over time have told multiple versions of a key story viewers heard in Leaving Neverland. So which is it? The version Joy Robson tells in her deposition or the version Dan Reed presents in Leaving Neverland? You know, the best part is, is that most of these fans that are out there, most of these people that eat this stuff up, they couldn't tell me what they did last month, but they're going to sit here and nitpick over a couple days. James Safechuck's dramatic scene where he claims Michael Jackson gave him jewelry for sex, including an alleged wedding ring, was deceptively staged and edited to appear as one seamless scene, when, in fact, it was actually edited together from filming done on two separate occasions 17 months apart, and done intentionally to pump up the drama of the scene. You can tell by looking at his clothes, essentially the same in both shots, except he forgot the undershirt the second time around. And look out the window. Clearly different seasons, with the plants trimmed in one shot, but not the other. Once people pointed out the changes, Dan Reed was forced to admit he went back and rented the same Airbnb to recreate and reshoot the scene nearly a year and a half later. Can viewers trust deceptive editing? Can viewers trust this nonsense? What is this? What is this? Deceptive editing, people. Oh my god, they, they went and did a pickup scene. Yeah, like pretty much every single production ever done from the beginning of time. Oh my goodness. I mean, this absolutely proves nothing. From what I understand, he was cleaning out his attic or something and he found the rings and then he told Dan Reed about it and that should be something that should be included, obviously. And so they went back and, and shot the scene. What is deceptive about that? Where is the deception? That's part of his complaint. That's part of what happened to him. We also have video that people uh, found of a news report talking about Michael Jackson with James Safechuck on film inside a jewelry store. And James himself said that happened more than once. I mean, what more? 
how are you? I just, um, I don't know. I can't. I, I have to stop it here because we're going on way too long. I will come back and I will finish this. I want to thank you so much and I hope that this is helpful. Uh, I just want to sort of recap some things. We have to be able to identify propaganda. Propaganda is going to be biased in nature, obviously. We know that just because something is biased doesn't necessarily mean it's untrue. First, we have to look at what they're telling us, and then we have to ask ourselves, well, what aren't they telling us? And that will be a good place for us to begin our research. We want to look up answers to the, the questions that we have, the stuff that they didn't tell us. We want to consider the statements that they're giving us. Any type of declarative statement that they're throwing out as a fact, is it something that they've proven? Are they going to give us facts about how they arrived at that conclusion? In many cases, they will not do that. We also found that there's a lot of imagery that's used. We saw the position right away way with Wade swearing in and then lies written on top of him. We saw the headlines ripped from the headlines. We see the documents flashed on the screen, but they don't actually tell you where those documents are from. All right. And in the next episode, we'll go ahead and follow up with the rest of this. And I'll be back. <laughs>